Thank you guys for coming, and apologies for my voice. Five days in Vegas will <laughs> do this to you. Um, I just wanted to quickly start by introducing myself. I'll be moderating today's panel, and I'm Brianne Story. I head up the affiliate network at Revenue Wire, and I'm joined by Chris Dykstra from Aaron Stoller, Paul Herdsman from Inbound uh, Call Experts, and Phil Schneider from AvantQuest Software. So before um, they dive into kind of what their companies do, we want to get a little bit of a feel for who's in the audience. So can you just raise your hand if you are a publisher or an affiliate? Awesome. Great. And any um, merchants or software developers, advertisers? Great. So a lot of you do with both sides of it. And how many people in here have worked in the software space before? Wonderful. Who yeah, work? who hasn't worked in the software space? Okay. And do what, what industry do you work in right now? Uh, careers. Careers, okay. And what about yourself? Me? Yes. Um, well, okay. And what type of niche? What type of offers? Anything? Anything? Great. Well, maybe software after this. <laughs> Great. So, so as I said, I am Brianne Story. I have been um, in the affiliate industry uh, since 2007, and uh, Revenue Wire is uh, one of the largest software affiliate networks. We are a payment processor for software developers. We have a network of call center partners, and we work with products like PC optimization, antivirus, and drivers to give you an idea of some of the offers that we have. And I'll pass it over to Chris to let you know about Aaron Stoller. Hi, everybody. Thanks again for coming. My name is Coolio. Um, no, it's somewhere else. Uh, Aaron Stoller is a bundling network. And I think the easiest way, the most effective way that I can talk about what bundling is, is we have a platform that offers ad units when an individual has already decided to download a software product. So when somebody's downloading, we offer up other options for would you also be interested in downloading A, B, and C. Um, that's probably the easiest way to look at that, and I think we'll probably get into it a little bit more later. Great. And pass it over to Paul. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Paul Herzman. Brian, thank you. You're welcome. Um, real quick, if you guys ask some questions and I don't give good answers, it's because I've been in Vegas for three days, it's not because I don't know the answer. Um, <clears throat> Uh, inbound call experts, I'll give two, two explanations because uh, some of you guys are not in the software world, but to my wife from when I'm at birthday parties, uh, we're a virtual geek squad, so we uh, remote, um, we diagnose and fix computers remotely, so customers don't have to unplug their computer, bring it to the store and sit in line and get their computers fixed, but uh, if I were trying to court somebody like you that uh, distribute software, I would never use the words tech support or even tech services. You know, we're, we want to be an extension of you guys online um, through the call center. Great. Thanks. And Phil. Okay. First, <laughs> that picture, I don't know where they got that picture. I that, think was a, that was a karaoke bar I think in Paris. I drunk doing karaoke. I think I was singing like a virgin. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, as it says there, I've been doing software longer then Brianne's been alive. And uh, I started my first company back in 1984 and was selling software over in Europe. I keep getting kicked out of different countries. And so uh, when they threw me out of Germany, I came back to the States and then went to France for a while. They kicked me out. So now I'm back here. Um, I work for AvantQuest Software. We have, I guess, about a thousand different software products that we sell in different countries around the world. So it's really, and that's part of what I wanted to go through today, is sort of give you a perspective on the different things we've seen with software and what type of things you can do. Um, we're a public company. We do about, I guess, $120 million. I think of in euro most of the time. But yeah, about $120, $130 million in software sales each year. Great. So um, today, obviously, we're going to just dive right into the topic of why software isn't dead. But we're going to talk a lot more on some of the monetization methods and how each part of um, the different the industry has changed over the last, you know, I think, the last two, three years, we've seen the biggest change um, in the software space. 
And then, if you guys have any questions, we really do want this to be interactive. So, we, you feel free to interject, or if you want us to dive into something a bit more, or provide more explanations on it, just raise your hand and let us know. So, I guess, I'm just going to pass it over to you guys. Yep. Can, I, can I start with something? Because I think the whole, I mean, God, you know, the topic was so morbid, the is, <laughs> why software isn't dead. And I actually think it's sort of funny because I've been doing this for such a long time that I'm nearly dead. But, the, um, <laughs> but what, what I found interesting is, you know, as we've done this, you know, I've seen it really transition. When I started selling software, we were actually doing, you know, it was DOS, which, you know, was really cool. It was like this C thing right on the screen. And, you know, it was like we were doing that. And it transitioned. And all our sales were, you know, it was obviously boxes. There was no such thing as online. So we were selling boxes of software. And I think a lot of the stuff when they talk about software is dead, it's sort of been, there's been this decline in retail software, okay? We, Avonquest, our business used to be probably 80% stuff that's sold at Best Buy, Staples, and their European counterparts, okay? That business has really, has really declined. And last year was the first, but despite that, I think we're still doing $40 million in sales through, for retail stores like that. Last year was the first year where our online sales actually were greater than what we were doing in, in the retail market. And I always think of, you know, when they say software is dead, you know, I basically, uh, am I allowed to say bullshit? Yes. Okay. It's yeah, affiliate I, I basically, okay, yeah, yeah. I, I basically say crap, that's crap, no, bullshit. Um, you know, it's evolving, and I think that's one of the things. And the people who are really best at this are, are smart people like them, who sort of evolve the different models and do it. And I laugh in our company because we sell, I mean, we're selling desktop software, we have apps, we have all these different things, like a thousand different titles. But really what we make our money on is stuff that's on the desktop. And I was talking to these developers, they're doing some of the apps, okay, for Android, for iOS, and they're like, man, why do you guys even do that desktop stuff? It's like, how can you like, get out of bed in the morning knowing you're doing that? And I'm like, 98% of our revenue comes from desktop software. You know, apps are really just getting started. I think the, the universe there is definitely, yeah, there's a lot going on. But there is so much money in what we're doing with the regular desktop software. And so, is software dead? Hell no, it's evolving, but really all business is. And the next thing is, even the stuff that they're making fun of me, oh, why do you do this, it's dead. It's like, yeah, because that's where the money is. I assume most people in this room sort of like making money. I sort of like promoting world peace and making money at the same time. But I really think that can be done with software. So, go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Phil. <laughs> like, you know, you bring... You bring up a really interesting point. It's certainly core software isn't dead. What we, I think, need to get into is distribution models are changing. And we work in such a volatile industry that it's very easy to forget that it wasn't that many years ago um, that it was packaged CD-ROMs, and that was how you got software, and that was the only way that you got your software. It's only been in recent years that broadband connectivity has been far field enough to allow for downloads of software, larger software, and games, for that matter, um, to get onto people's computers directly. So the, the model of retail for software, I'd say if it's not dead, it's certainly dying, and that would be parallel to your mm -hmm. comment of what you guys are seeing uh, in that market shift. But what we're seeing now that software is being distributed digitally, there's so many different ways that we can mix and match and offer up different options to developers and marketers uh, within the space. And I think that's what we want to really get into here is the, the, the opportunities. No, I, I just think it's funny you think CD-ROMs were there. No, we were distributing on floppy disks. <laughs> you are old. I saw that in a museum once. <laughs> I never distributed on 80 inch. It was the five, it was the hard quarter. Yeah, yeah. I the hard floppies. Three and a half. So you guys want to, maybe let's throw it over to you guys, and what are some of the trends that you're seeing? What's changing in a space? I'll just sort of continue on the, the, that same line of thought is, you know, what are the options? Uh, it doesn't have to be a pay and play model, which is really the retail. You pay all the money up front, the developer makes their money 100% up front, and then hopes for um, uh, renewed sales after the license expires. 
Now we're seeing a lot more subscription models. I mean, I think a lot of people have um, service software, software as a service, like Netflix, Dropbox, et cetera. There's a lot out there um, that's becoming more prevalent within the software space, within this category. Um, Phil and I have had a lot of conversations even just this week about, you know, what, what is the, what's the new model? Is there a new model? Is, we talk about free software. We talk about freemium software, subscription software, and then retail is certainly not dead, yeah. not digitally. So my contention, I've put it up to sort of argument at this point, is that the person, if you're marketing a piece of software to a person for free, it's not the same market group as somebody who's going to buy a piece of software at $39.99. People will scour the internet and spend hours to find something that is free. Now, of course, when we actually get into this, nothing's free in the world. We all know that. Somebody's paying for it. Um, in the bundling world, it's advertisers through search, through coupons, through sale as well. We do a lot of work with paid software that we back out to a PPI, which is paper install. Um, so it really is about opportunities and options for software developers and marketers. You know, I, I, I have to agree with you for a change. It was really funny. Really? Some of, yeah, yeah. Because some yeah. of our conversations, he was like, oh, you know, it's all changing. Things are moving to free. And, and we sort of went through. And it's really interesting when you look at it. And it's just it's what he said about different groups. There are some people that will never buy software. You know, they're out there. They're on download sites. They're, they're going for things. There are other people that buy software. And when you look, even at some of the biggest categories, companies that have billion dollar valuations, like security companies like Norton, it's like, why do people really buy Norton? You know, AVG, LavaSoft, there's some outstanding free products there. Well, why do people buy it? Different people react differently. And I, you know, again, you can't always kiss and tell and stuff like that, but yeah, a friend of mine, it was really interesting because he, he had an idea, he looked and there was a really popular free product out there. And his thing was, you know, most people are like, oh crap, there's a free product here. You know, I can't sell in this category. They killed it. And he's like, wow, there's a free product here. It's getting shitloads of traffic. Am I allowed to say shitloads? Sure. Okay, yes. good. Um, the, and he's like, I want to make one of these. And so he goes and he makes a product to compete with the free product and he starts selling it for like 29 or 39 bucks. And I remember when he was talking to me about it, I'm like, well, that's sort of stupid, man. Oh my God, he made so much money doing it. And I'm like, how, you know, why? He's like, well, they're giving it away for free. They can't afford to pay as much for the advertising as I can. And he was able to go and turn that into a success. So when I look at some of the stuff we do, you know, there are a lot of really great, there, you know, with software, there's a lot of different verticals out there. I think, you know, with Revenue Wire, we really see a lot of success in the, um, in the optimization registry part, in driver. You know, people are having trouble with their computers. They want them to work. And, they're out looking for that stuff. And guess what? They're willing to give you money to make their computer work. You know, the same with data recovery. Oh my God, I just deleted all my photos. I feel like a complete idiot. How do I get them back? They're willing to pay for that, okay? And a lot of people really feel much more secure paying for something because they know there's a company behind it rather than downloading something for free and, you know, not knowing, well, how do these guys make their money? Is this just, you know, there, there are different mentalities on that type of thing. And so we've been able, you know, what we've seen is there are companies out there incredibly successful. You know, LavaSoft with, free, with their free version is very successful, it's out there, but they also sell software and make a lot of money with it. AVG with their free version, same thing. And you have, you know, Semantic out there, Norton, that's doing a great job also on just a paid model. So I think there's a lot of different models out there that you can go after in, in software and, and really find success in different ways. So, Interesting segue into white labels as yeah. well, where you can literally take the same piece of software and market it to each of these groups. You know, I've always haven't had the opportunity, but I really would like to run, if nothing for other than academic reasons, you know, run the same piece of software market is very similar, and run it free, run it freemium, run it subscription, and run it paid. And it really is about when are you going to recoup the money? What is your risk tolerance for for um, recoup um, versus time? Uh, yeah, just to jump in, um, software certainly is not dead. Uh, two years ago, we started with 12 people, and uh, today we have over 1,100 answering the phone, and we work with software distributors. And uh, it, it's a compelling, uh, it's a compelling um, partnership because, like Phil said, people have problems with their computers, and they need to get them fixed. And 
Uh, when I was in the software business, if somebody would approach me and said, Paul, you know, you guys sell an anti-spyware for $39.95, uh, I want to talk to that person and I'm going to convert that person to a premium tech service plan for, at 28% of the time at $300. I would have said no chance. But uh, we, do it every, we do it every day and we, we're doing it with lots and lots of people. So uh, there's other ways to monetize the customer after they've checked out of the, 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 the cart. Uh, usually you would just give them the key, they'd be on their way and you'd be like, all right, let's go get another customer. But um, it, it, it's really amazing uh, what, what we've been able to do with Road and Wire and uh, some other partners. I think in the last 24 months, we've seen support being coming a critical, being a critical part of the um, economic ecosystem of the software distribution space. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, can, I, I just yeah. wanted to add something. What was really interesting for me, coming from the perspective of we, it was like we sell software. We have a product, right? And the product was there. It was like, oh, people's computers are slow. They need to be clean. They're worried about privacy. All these types of things. And we were thinking about it from a product perspective. And we, we heard this whole thing about oh, all these guys offering support, and we're just like, oh, they're trying to fleece them for the money. You know, and it's like, and my perspective totally changed, especially when you see the customer satisfaction data that comes out of these things. What it really is, the people that are looking for that type of software, it's not like they're looking for software, they're looking for a solution to a problem. And when, when I realized that, it's like, I actually have, my users are happier after his guys help them out than when they just bought my software. Or a lot of them can't even, this is really bad. I, I wish he could turn off the camera. Because it's like you never lose money <laughs> by, by basically, you, you, you can't overestimate how stupid people are. And, and myself included. I, I always, like, when we make our software, you know, one of the things I do is like some of these things, I try to design, I was like, I want my mom to be able to use it, okay? And I'm old, so you know, my mom, she's even older, and I, that was like the stupidest thing I've said all day, and I've said a lot of stupid <laughs> things. And so, I'm sitting there, and it's like, we try to make it for my mom. Well, here's the thing, one of the things we saw is that the people coming to my page, we're driving them to download and install software. And I don't know what, what you guys see, but it's like of the people that come that hit the lander and click on the download button, we were looking at install rates, and it's only 50 to 60% of the people that click and download actually run the installation. And I'm like, what's, what's going on here? There's, there's got to be something wrong. It's like, they're so stupid, they can't figure out when they download it how to then run the software to do it. So, you know, oh, I've just deleted all my pictures. I, I like find this thing, I download it, I can't even figure out how to install it. It's like, dude, there's no way you're getting those pictures out. You're so stupid. You know, it's not, they're not coming back, okay? So when they go on the phone with someone like him, it's like, I'll walk you through doing it. And they're like, it's going to cost 100 bucks. They're like, thank you so much, okay? Now, that changed my perspective. And I think when we talk about selling software, you know, and the whole thing, it's like, well, maybe what I should do is to make my software to help sell these services, you know? And that's really what a lot of affiliates are doing now. They're saying, well, the software is a way that I can actually get people and drive them to the support thing. The, the, my business, when we look at that, isn't about selling the software product. It's about helping the user solve a problem. And some of it may be through my software, and some of it, you know, especially for more advanced users, and for the users that clearly can't figure out how to click, download, and install, they need his guys, you know? But this has really changed the model and the way that we think about software. And certainly for, for affiliates and the whole revenue model and how much we're making. I mean, you know, I don't know, again, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but you know, it's, you can see 50% of your revenue or more coming from the support services. So it's really, really significant. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, large player, I'd say the largest players, that's the largest player, they're backing it out. Yeah, yeah no doubt. Um, like I said, the, 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 it's a really good mix. When we, fix, when we, when we pick the phone up, uh, there, there, there's two reasons why the customer's calling. They're either not happy with the performance of their computer or there's something stopping them from using their computer normally. So, uh, you know, it's a compelling argument for the customer and uh, the convenience factor. Uh, we did some, this is a pretty good story, but we did a, I like to do some comparison shopping and I did something the other day with Geek Squad. So I took my personal computer in there and. You know, I had the text, you know, mess it up a little bit, and I dropped it off, and I sat in line for 45 minutes, and, you know, they sent me an email four days later, computer's ready, and I'm a busy guy. I can't get there. I can't go pick the computer up. And so they sent me a letter saying, if you don't come get it, we're going to throw it in the garbage. 
Yeah, so I said, babe, I said, my wife, babe, you got to go get the computer. They're going to throw it out. I really want it. You know, this, this, this little test is turning into a disaster. So she goes to get the computer, sits in line for another hour. They plug it in. It's not working. So I've been without my computer for 45 days. It's still not working. And uh, it's a terrible inconvenience. Uh, so, you know, when we remote onto somebody's computer and say, listen, we can fix this within, you know, the next several hours and you can get back on there, you can sit and watch us do whatever you want to do. It's a great, great, uh, it's a good offer. It's, it's very convenient for them. And those, the people that call us are the people that want reassurance. They like to ask questions and they like to, they like to feel reassured that, did I buy the right piece of software? Yes, you bought the right piece of software. Um, you know, the, the, you guys only have 60 seconds to make a compelling argument for somebody to buy software. 60 seconds, that's all you get. If that. If that. And if it's not, if it doesn't look great, if it doesn't come off the page, on the next thing. We get 25 minutes. We get 30 minutes, 35 minutes to talk to people. So they ask a lot of questions. We give them very good answers. And, you know, we turn them into customers a high percentage of the time. Can I get my mom and dad a subscription so they stop calling me? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. We do that for all our friends. Hey, there's another thing about software. I mean, we're talking now about the utility software area where it's like people want to fix something and the support is a natural fix there. You know, I, in our catalog at AvonQuest, we have somewhere around 1,000 products. So I started thinking, because if you really think of that with, with software, it's like, hey, it's not about me having the product. It's about what the user wants. We started looking at other products we have and how would that fit with other areas. We call it an ecosystem around the product. And we were thinking about home soft, you know, we have home design software, an example, okay? Home design software, it's like, oh, I wanna, you know, make my house beautiful and all this, and I wanna design the software. Well, there's another great affiliate play on that because there's stuff like uh, home, home Advisor where, you know, they'll pay me for the leads I get. So I can drive people to come and look at my software, and then I can, you know, sort of say, oh, by the way, if you're looking to get your house redone, you know, here's a place where you can find contractors and stuff like that. And again, changes the economics of what it was to market software. In some ways, I'm using that software to drive leads for, for this other offer. And so I think there's some really creative ways when you look at software, what you can do with it. Some of it comes from, yeah, the direct sale of the software, but other pieces of it say, hmm, which fits with these other offers that I might be able to find from affiliate networks? How can I use the software to sort of further monetize traffic I may have for these things? That really yes. falls into the options that we were talking about. Yeah. Thinking outside of the box, how else can you monetize other than just charging $39.99 up front? Yeah, a that's a good point. Um, you know, when we were selling software, we didn't have the back end, we didn't have the tech support, so we had to be profitable on the front end. You know, it's getting very difficult to do that. So, you know, now software distributors figure out if I can just break even on the front end, if I can just get close, the, uh, the back end can take care of itself and they can still do very well at it. Phil, you were talking about apps earlier and, you know, certainly even a couple years at Affiliate Summit, everything was mobile, 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 everywhere. And I certainly got the impression this year here that there was a lot of talk about download. So, you know, the PC space, there's still, like Phil, you said earlier, there's a lot of money to be made here, which is why we're all in it. Um, one of the things that come out of the app space, though, is this expectation of free. You know, free 99 cents, um, which is why we've seen the growth of free software, which we've seen the growth of freemium software, um, where we're being able to push that back. And call center is one way to help monetize that. Bundling is another way to monetize that. And that's utilizing advertiser dollars in the form of search revenue, um, shopping revenue, uh, and like I said, as an actual software distribution mechanism, because we actually do put software titles, paid software titles, within the bundle. So we'll offer up an optimization product with call center attached to that, and that becomes you know, effectively a cheap lead for the software company. Yeah. The, um, I, you guys. There, there are like three people in here who haven't done software already. One of the uh, little known secrets of software is when you drive people, you have a certain conversion rate. And so if you give someone a free trial of a product, you know, except for my software, probably 100% of them buy. Usually, I think in, the in, in industry averages, you know, you, they say 1% to 2% or something. So, you know, 98 out of 100 people aren't buying the software. And I think one of the real things that's changed recently is you have companies like Air Installer that what they're doing is they're actually monetizing the install of the software. So those 98 people that normally you made no money from, 
you know, a lot of people, and this is what a lot of affiliates are doing, they're taking, they're taking software, they're using installer, you know, Air Installer, and they're getting money from the actual installs, and then they still make sales off the software. Again, it's a completely different model from, you know, what you were doing, what we were doing, stuff like that. But another way that has sort of changed the economics of the whole distribution of software. It's also made, you know, when, when there was free software in the past, it's always like how to monetize, you know, and really the types of offers that they have, the things that they're doing now, it's made, you know, it's really given free software, you know, a way to, to monetize. And, you know, we're even working, we're providing some products mm -hmm. to, to them that, you know, that are free and they're out there distributing and the money's made through the thing. We also look at applications where the revenue model isn't about the actual purchase of the software, but maybe there's a free software, you're monetizing through the offers that are there, sorry for punching you, and you're actually able to then get, you know, sort of the same way they do with apps, where you have an in-product upsell, or maybe, you know, there's a free version of the product, and there's a pro version of it yeah. that you can then buy off of that. Upsell, cross-sell, one of our most popular um, software titles that's our own internal because um, we have our own software titles that we offer for free in order to provide traffic for the bundle. Uh, software Updater, so it keeps your software updated. Um, works fantastically, it lets you know when your flash is ready, Java is ready, any update that needs to be done on your computer lets you know. That obviously ties really nicely into drivers. So, so a driver upgrade, so purchase of a up driver product, natural upgrade within that. Um, meanwhile, we're monetizing the actual bundle flow. You know, through um, other advertising partners, some of which I recognize out in the crowd. International. International. Are we seeing any trends? This is, I actually don't know what the answer to this question is. Any trends in paid versus free versus whatever that you're seeing or that you guys are seeing from international traffic? I can make music sagen, this is relative like in the verschiedene Länder. I find it neat. What? Wrong. Uh, Language. Really, you know what's what's interesting to me is in the um, we sell, you know, we we're primarily based, you know, in the Western European countries, Latin America, U.S. So English, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Italian, German, French, and it's it's really for me what is incredible is how similar they are. When I first started doing this and came to Avonquest, they were like telling me, "Oh man." That would never work in France, you know, it's like what works, you know, in France is completely different from what works in Germany and that's different in the US, you know, you're completely different. And the truth is, in retail it might have been like that because you might have had strong players that had a brand in a specific country. What we found online is our initial premise was, oh, it has to be like this. But when we started selling online, we were able to sell the same product across the different territories. We found that the user behavior we see is remarkably similar. Now, instead of assuming that people in different countries act differently, we assume that the behavior will be the same and we look for areas in our split test where we might find a difference. So I would always assume that it's gonna be fairly similar. The biggest thing we find that's different between territories is going to be price, okay? You can't, you know, Brazil's a great example. It's like people there just don't earn as much money here. So if you're trying to sell at the pr same price you are in another thing, it's probably not gonna work for you, okay? So you need to adjust the price for that, the price of your main offer, the price of the cross sales, things like that. That's the thing we find that differs the most in the different, um, in the different territories. But it's it, really interesting, the, the user behavior, it was remarkably similar in the different places we looked. You know, we do find some differences, but overall, I was stunned at how similar it was. And to speak the obvious, credit card availability um, in countries where credit yeah. cards are harder to come by, Obviously, free is a natural uh, angle to go. Do you guys want to open it up to so. any questions that are out there? Yeah, go ahead. I can take a step of that one, cool. start off. We work with a lot of marketers. So they're taking our software, they'll have their own white labels, et cetera, and they're pushing those free products. Um, I'm always talking about the chicken and egg situation. For us, I'm always looking at what does the total bundle value 
which is the amount of revenue that you as a publisher is going to earn for that. Um, it really comes down to what's happening in that particular country. You can have the traffic and not the monetization, and the monetization and not the traffic. For example, right now, Brazil's coming into maturity. It's finally, um, the money's finally there to support the traffic. Um, we've seen incredible success um, personally in France, Germany, but UK, you know, the English speaking um, non US uh, geos, Canada, we're Canadian, <laughs> we're a Canadian company, um, but we're 80% US, 20% international. Um, my expectation is to double that this year to 40% international. Ireland, nothing. We just assume it's always Google in Ireland. No. Um, we don't have any Irish traffic that, unless it's being lumped into um, UK or GB. You know, I think, I think what we need is a trip to Ireland to sort of further explore this. Uh, really, with Ireland, you're looking at a country, I think the population is about 3.5 million. So there's not a lot of people doing a lot of focus just on, on Ireland. Uh, I know we've run some campaigns there. I think, I think it was pretty expensive. You know, it's small, so you're not going to do a whole bunch of optimization on, on a population that size. Um, you know, when you, when you asked about the markets and which one's the best, you know, I pretty much have to say Canada because of some of the people on the table with me. We love Canada. Now, the U.S. is really the place where you get the most traffic, but when, when you're looking at doing this, a lot of stuff really comes from the fact of where can you make, you know, where can you be profitable? Where do you have the best chance of success? So the U.S. is, yet yeah, it's definitely the biggest, but it's also extremely competitive. So you may find other people that are saying, oh, we do much better, you know, we do much better in France, or we do much better in, you know, in Colombia or Argentina or Brazil, because maybe there's a little bit less competition there. And you so, can turn the question around as well. Let's say you were saying to me, I have a ton of traffic in Ireland. Right? That's a very different way to yeah. look at this. And that's what I was saying, sort of the chicken and egg. If you were to come to me and say, Chris, I've got a ton of traffic. This is where it's coming from. I really think I could do well. I hear, what I would do is go to my advertisers, negotiate rates for Ireland so that we have a high bundle yield that would then make it viable. And that's really, you know, when I get into that chicken and egg conversation, that's a lot of the conversations. Um, colleague of mine sitting in the crowd there, Marco, he deals with the publishing side. I deal on the advertising side. So very often, this very conversation will happen. He'll come to me and be like, hey, Chris, what do we got going on in Argentina? And I'm like, nothing, should we? And then we go from there. And you had a second question? Right. There, there, are different, there are different ways to do it. I mean, one of the, one of the uh, problems that you'll face is when you're paying for your traffic, okay, the cheaper you make the product, the harder it is to be profitable, okay? Well, when, when we started marketing, we were doing a lot of the email stuff at AvonQuest. We have a very large email list, lots of customers that have bought software with us for some of them decades. And, you know, email marketing, they're not really asking for something, you're always doing it with a discount, right? Because that's the call to action. Otherwise, if you get a you know, thing, the, S, uh, the, the, the standard retail price is $29, buy today, why? Um, so, you know, hey, we'll make it 19 bucks, buy today, or the offer goes away in 48 hours. It's different with PPC when you're doing a lot of these things. If people are trying to, you know, recover their photos, if they're trying to fix their computer and make it faster, it really, the discount is, it's more about solving their problem. And you're really looking, when you play with the whole metrics in these things, you know, a lot of the prices, we do a lot of testing on things like that. What is the optimum price to sell the product? 
and we try to keep it at the higher rate. Now you can do things where you have a, you know, you can set the SRP of your product higher and say, you know, we're going to discount here on, on the lander if you buy within 24 hours and, you know, and try and drive it like that, that works. But you don't want to discount too much or you're, you're actually going to lose money because, you know, you get a certain number of conversions, it doesn't increase them enough to offset the drop in revenue that you're taking from the discount. Yeah, Did I, that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah, just to, I would just say test, test, test. You know, you, you, yeah. you're, you're going to market software online, you got to test everything. But uh, a lot of our partners that we've been working with are actually trying to get more people through the purchase page because they want to get more people to call because uh, it's been so profitable and lucrative for them. So, uh, again, you know, depending on what you're promoting and what your costs are, you know, we have guys coming to us now and saying, Paul, we're going to run a special offer, expect X amount more calls. Well, that's great. So. Uh, testing and you know work figuring out how to monetize outside of uh, you know your standard uh, procedures is great. And the other point, speaking to sort of that Brazilian idea, is that you may be charging the same price. Your conversion rate is obviously going to be a lot lower. But it, in order for us to back it out, the market, the traffic, so much cheaper. So five cents can be completely yeah. viable in Brazil, whereas in the U.S. it would have to be fifty cents. Go ahead. Uh, what perspectives uh, do you see on uh, search toolbar monetization after Google shut down its own uh, search toolbar and uh, become really tough uh, with other guys so that like, uh, still advertise so the toolbars, uh, but uh, Google doesn't like it? You know, so there's, I'll take that one. Yeah, you take <laughs> We see, a, we obviously deal with a lot of um, toolbar partners. Um, we work with a lot of toolbar partners. It's continuously changing. Um, this time last year uh, was just prior to Google changing their policies, and they effectively stepped back out of the toolbar space to some degree. Now, obviously, there's large Google partners like Ask um, that are still running. Compliance is continually evolving. But the internet, as we know, is still very much the wild, wild west. And we have sheriffs in the room. The sheriffs that we look to are Yahoo, Google. Basically, where does the money originate from? And it all originates from advertisers. When you're talking about toolbars, when I talk about a toolbar, I mean search monetization. The reality is, we want to talk about trends. Toolbars are gone. They're done. They're finished. But search monetization, search monetizing extensions, will continue to exist and do continue to exist. Now, you mentioned something else about stealing of advertising, et cetera. That falls under a different category, as I look at it, into something that is commonly known as injection. So injecting ads over ads, injecting ads into white space, this is something that became very prevalent in the space last year, something that um, frankly got out of control and we have completely banned from our network due to the fact that we need to maintain positive relationships with Google, Yahoo, our distribution channel partners. Um, but these policies are continually changing. So one of the big changes last year was the uninstall process. So anything that we install in one bundle, we have to uninstall in one bundle. Um, those are Google's policies. So I hope that answers some of it. Yeah, and I, I have a slightly different perspective there. It's, you know, we're selling to our users. Uh, I did some toolbar stuff in the past, but we, we didn't really like the user experience. So it, we saw a lot of users complaining about it and things like this. I'd never done anything with ad injection and, and that type of thing. I didn't like that, so I stayed away from it. Um, from our perspective, you know, I look at it, I'm looking more at user experience. I, when we get users, and this is one thing, you know, this is where white labeling of software, we work with, you know, through Revenue Wire with a lot of white label partners. And one of the things that we do is we really want, you know, we try to keep our customers happy because we remarket to them via email and try to sell them other products and do things like that. And so I think there's, you know, you get some, some affiliates that have like the slash and burn thing, you know, hey, we're gonna install everything, man. We're gonna do ad injection, we're gonna do this, man. These guys will never be able to, you know, open their computer without seeing 30 ads. I, I don't want that experience for my user. So from my perspective, it's really, it was more, more about user. There's always this thing about, yeah, we need to make money, but we also know that having that loyal user 
when we get people that are using our stuff, it's worth a lot to us. And so from that perspective, I actually make more money not using toolbars than I would if I... Yeah, I you right? Just retail. <coughs> yeah. Just yeah. selling the product. We, we, we mostly monetize by selling the product, yeah. Very seldom do we talk about affiliate quality, but certainly traffic quality is very important. And obviously there's a lot of channels that frankly we just cannot run due to the fact that our largest partners, the largest monetization component within a bundle is always the toolbar, it's always the search monetization. And that search feed is coming from one of two places, Google, Yahoo, right? So you can't, literally cannot afford to piss them off. You have to play on the right side. So torrent traffic out, you know, things that are in direct conflict to the contract that you have with those advertising partners. Again, we're offering free software. And again, nothing is free. We know that we know that in this room, nothing is free and we're like, you know, Gmail is not free. They serve you ads during your experience. They read your emails and serve you contextual ads based on that. You know, nothing is free. So we have search monetization, coupon monetization, and like I said, we're actually backing out software. And that's something that I've seen within Air Installer, we've seen a trend of, is more of that. And the nice part about that is the user experience is better. We're just providing the opportunity um, for the user to discover a piece of software. The heavy lifting that we're able to do um, is that we're able to get the software on the computer. Then it's up to the application to prompt the user to actually convert. Yeah, and I think from my perspective, I never thought about like, you know, good affiliates, crappy affiliates. I mean, we, we never really wanted affiliates that were doing like the really horrible things out there. So we, we always tried to keep our software very compliant, not just because of Google, but you know, we, we did some testing and what we found is the more transparent we were, we actually saw an increase in conversion rate when we toned down language and really were, were very open and really put stuff in, like in PC Speed Maximizer, we're showing them what we're cleaning, we're explaining what we're doing, we tell them if we aren't able to clean things, and that actually helped us, you know? It's like, it's not about duping the user. I think too many people think, you know, to be a good affiliate, man, I just have to scam these guys and give me their money, but at some point, it's different, you know? It's like, there are different types of users, and if you give that confidence and you're, you know, I think users sense that, so, I, I've never, I've never been pushing to get that kind of affiliate that's going to really push it to the edge on that stuff. Did you have another question? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, can you please tell a bit more about uh, the monetization? What do you mean by this? Yeah. Uh, you show up on Best Buy's. I mean, there's all sorts of executions, but I'll just provide an example. You show up on the Best Buy site, you're going to get a oh, okay. drop down saying, "Hey, you get 20% off." Eventually, it's feeding back into the um, you know, basic share or sale type of um, ecosystem. And you know what I find crazy about that? Is that the coupon, these coupon apps that actually give you a 20, you know, you're searching for something to give you a 20% off type thing. There's user value there. But these guys tried to be very sleazy about the way they implemented and got it in there. I think they're users who'd actually want that type of stuff. And I just think the approach, you know, I, I think there's a very it's execution. I think there's a very above board way of implementing that because I know a lot of people who shop who would love to know if I could save twenty percent when I'm about about to buy something. But again, it's the approach that, that's been taken to these things. And I think this is what I was talking about with the software when I went transparent. If I were doing that type of software, it's not something that I do. If I do it, 
I would want to do it more like an offer where you're saying to the user, hey, you know, when you go to certain sites, we have special offers. You may be able to save money. Just put it in there. And while you shop, if we find that we can save you money, we'll do it. I think a lot of people would be open to that and they trust it more. But when it gets on your computer and you don't know how it's there, you don't know how, where's it coming from. So I think this approach that, you know, it comes from a lot of people have always thought, oh, we'll just get it out there. It's that quick buck type of thing. I really think it's the wrong approach a lot of times. And I think what, what Google and Bing and Yahoo are forcing people to do, I, I think it's made affiliate, I think it changes the landscape. A lot of the affiliates we work with now are, are much more professional and real businesses than what we saw in the past. In the past it was like, you know, two guys in a room, ah, we can throw up a web page, drive a bunch of traffic and do whatever. And now we're seeing companies and, you know, we're providing email offers to them and they're trying to monetize their users post, you know, Thing. So it, it's a different type of user, and, and I think overall for the industry, I think that's a positive thing. This is a tough question because I'd probably do something with travel just because I'd like one uh, you know, tax write off to go to cool places around the world and hang out in my Speedo. That was a bad thought. What? Um, Why did you put that yeah. thought in my head? Yeah, sorry, man. No, uh, that's really tough. I think, ooh, there, there's something for me that has always been, I think it'd be hard to do. But the review site thing, doing a very above board, you know, I would love to write and blog about software. I've been doing it a really long time. I could think, I, I'd see that as being sort of cool. I'd get to play with new software and do it. I think it'd be really hard to make money. But, you know, unlike you, where everything has to be paid for it. Love is free, man. <laughs> My wife loves me. I'm a Such happy a hippie. <laughs> so so I, I don't know. You know, it's, I, wow, it's a really tough thing. I'd probably... I mean, for the money thing, I think sort of setting up the white label stuff and really going out and probably driving traffic as a white label where you're acting as a software company, I'd be, I'd probably position it small, very friendly. I'd use a, a tone where I try to get more of a rapport with the user and really try and, and create some value that way. But, you know, th again, that comes from my background. Direct to consumer that's very much my approach so actually instead of, as opposed to building out a website for example actually building out a product utilizing the multitude of different monetization channels that you know I've come to know and work with but as Phil was sort of talking about doing it doing the execution in such a fashion that it is value add and not just you know a quick slash and burn yeah yeah I would just say I would set it up like a company, I'd set up for the long term. I'd set up where you're really adding value. You're really showing customers that you know when they land at your site, this is this is going to help them. Um, you know, the the, the, the quick money is it's, it's it's not fun. It's, you get emails about chargebacks, refunds. It's just not going to last very long. So if you guys are you know really serious, really want to get into it, have a long term goal, have a long term plan, and you'll be much more successful. Yeah, and, and I think that's one of the things, again, you know, I know other, other verticals let you do some white, white label stuff, but it's one of the things that I think is interesting in, in software. With the white label thing, affiliates, a lot of affiliates are just acting, you know, we have guys and they are software companies. They're selling our software and they're acting like a software company. You say, yeah, well, you're doing that. Well, you know what? They focus and they have different levels of expertise that we do. Some of them are marketing in countries where we may not, that may not be one of the territories where I have native language speaker and they're doing the newsletters and the whole thing and they're creating, you know, really adding value in that level. And so I think there are definitely opportunities there for affiliates that, that look at it from that perspective. Go ahead. From a publisher perspective, no, we're not actively marketing to that geo, but there's definitely been a trend of companies out of China that are making big pushes um, internationally. So as advertisers within the space. I, I've not been successful selling software in China. We've done some of it, but it's never been a real, you know, 
at this point, it's not been a real area of focus for us or anywhere where we've, you know, when we look at new markets like that, we, we test, we run some campaigns, we try to see if we think we can turn it into something successful where we can really focus on it. And the things that we've done, we never had the level of, uh, never had a level of success that really made us focus. So I'm not really doing much there. I think there's multiple things. Uh, it could be a lot of what I've seen in China, it's more mobile than it is desktop and computer type stuff. We sell mostly desktop software, so it's different there. I've done some mobile app testing. I think the culture of buying is slightly different than what we're used to. So you don't always see the conversion rates and the buying at the level that, you know, the way you're used to it from the normal, what I call the, the Western countries, what we, what we normally see, it just doesn't happen that way in China. And maybe, you know, maybe it's my marketing stuff. We actually have an office in China, but it's more developers and they're helping us with the marketing and it could be that they just don't know how to talk to people. Maybe I should hire some marketing people and that just sounds so obvious as I say it. I feel like an idiot. <laughs> God, this session should be why Phil is stupid. <laughs> Yep. yep. You know, basically, a lot of that question is, you know, the guys from Revenue Wire tell me you're a good guy. You know, we just want to work with you. I, I just trust them. So uh, we do a lot of stuff there. You know, it really has to do with potential and a lot of the stuff with White Label. And if we, if you know, if they tell me this dude's smart, I just believe him. Um, and so we we do a lot of White Labels with them. The you know, how it works, there are different ways, but you know, you can own your customer as a white label thing. It's, it's like you're, you're a software company. These are really good questions, and we're looking at, you know, a lot of the stuff we're doing on, on the iPad, it, it's, it's different. I'm selling some edutainment, you know, sort of games, educational stuff. Um, you know, it, it's really hard because when you're doing like 100, you know, around that, 100 million in sales, right? And all of a sudden, like the first year you start doing mobile, you have like eight developers, you create this and you do $360,000 in sales with your applications, and you read articles telling you that, oh, that makes you a successful developer of apps? You're like, how am I ever gonna make money doing this? So, you know, I, I look at different models, I see people doing, we're, we're figuring it out. I think a lot of people are looking at mobile. There's some great success stories, you know, we all wanna be the next Angry Birds, or uh, that's so yesterday, I don't even know what the successful one is now, or uh, Snapchat, yeah. I love Snapchat, man. Um, but, but, you know, the truth is there's so many apps out there that are unsuccessful. I, I, think, I think it's still being figured out, you know, it, it really is, is just a game. It's hard to figure out the monetization there and how to turn it into real money. Completely right, and I'm doing stuff now where we have applications where we create desktop, mobile, so we, we have it across the range of things. And what we look at is the actual monetization from that 
complete product, not looking at mobile separate from the desktop, but saying, is it worth it from the product as a whole to do the different things? So yeah, that's a great point. I think that's going to be something that we do see a lot more of this year, is we look at what the acquisition cost on mobile is versus what the acquisition cost on PC is. It's dramatically different. So if you have an application, so your market could be mobile. You could have an application that you're installing on the PC that bridges the two together. Um, if you do it right, that becomes potentially an extremely successful way of acquiring users. Yeah, just to throw something in there, uh, you know, you could have PC utility software uh, that you're driving to consumers, and you know, if you're using the call center piece, you hook that piece in, and you know, when we're talking to a lot of people, they have iPads, they have tablets, they have iPhones that they, can you help me with this? And um, yes, we can. So if we sold a plan to them and you know, additional services, you would still be making money indirectly, but uh, through still desktop applications. Great, I'm just gonna end questions now because we are at three o'clock, but um, there's everyone's contact information if you um, wanna shoot them an email or feel free to come chat with any of us after. And thanks for attending.